Good morning to you all. Joining us from Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Ireland, Lebanon, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Nigeria, Taiwan, the United States of America, and throughout the UK. Welcome to this virtual reality and live art streaming webinar to preserve our health and well being, our brain health. Inspired by our chair today, Professor Samuel Gray, to bring an innovative range of cultural and creative stimulation to enliven the lives of people who are isolated or living in care homes so that they can participate or ingeniously feel they are participating in wonderful, wondrous activity. It is everyone's human right to participate in the arts. And our speakers today show how technology opens up this world to enable them to experience awe and wonders of the wilds of nature and to join in, sing and dance. So it is truly splendid to have with us today leaders in the, in the technology that can make this happen. Activists, national and international exponents, and our Chair Samuel Gray, for a long time Chief Knowledge Officer of the NHS, is Director of the Optimal Aging Programme at the University of Oxford, running a campaign to reduce your risk of dementia. The web address and link to his book, Increase Your Brain Ability and Reduce Your Risk of Dementia, will be included in this seminar transcript. Some 55 million people around the world have dementia. Participating in artistic endeavor can hugely enhance their lives, transform their sense of despair and isolation into opportunities for joyous discovery, stimulating uplift and introduce feelings of desire. I speak on behalf of Arts for Dementia, the UK charity specializing in re-energizing arts workshop practice for early stage dementia at cultural venues with a website signposting arts events for all stages of dementia in the community by art form, virtual accessibility, dementia need, and postcode. Recently, we have been looking at how GPs can refer patients from the onset of symptoms to social prescribing link workers who can direct them to social heart activities suited to their interests, their culture, and to their needs to preserve their brain health, nourish, and reinvigorate their lives. Sharing imaginative ideas, making music, performing dancing, creating together, helps modify risk factors for dementia and nurture resilience for person and carer living, both living with dementia. The advances of technology, virtual reality and live art streaming greatly taken up during and since the pandemic have opened up innovative opportunities that can now bring glorious cultural experiences to people living in isolation, hospital, care homes. Today's webinar, is Samuel's initiative. He is determined that whatever a person's cultural favorites, music, arts, dance, drama, the natural world can be live streamed to them. Before handing over to Muir, here is a resume of the speakers you will hear today. Martin Robinson, who is living with postcortical atrophy, has sent a recording to explain the value of technology of keeping him in touch and the energizing impact of virtual reality. Martin hopes to join us later. There will then be two panels of five fascinating speakers. Each expert in their field will talk for five minutes, followed by a chaired discussion. So Charles King, Chief Operating Officer, Rover Symptoms, Reclaiming Health and Wellbeing. Professor Khalid Aziz, Lead Communication Skills Coach uh, of the Aziz Corporate. Michael Blackstud, Digital Media Access for Care Homes. Claire Soundercock, Head of Insight at the Eden Project, Gold Partnership with Center for Health Technology at the University of Plymouth. And Kunle Adewale, artist, um, is talking about arts for brain health in Nigeria, creativity and digital equity for Nigerian seniors, virtual reality arts. That's the first panel. Our second panel speakers will be Rosa Corbishley, Development Director of Bristol Beacon, LSO Live Streaming Orchestral Partnerships with Care Homes, Susanna Bedford, and uh, Joe Pick will uh, present uh, Armchair ga Gallery on behalf of City Arts Nottingham. Sophie Dunn, Director of Live Music Now Southwest, um, will discuss Live Music Now's live stream concerts um, and, and Douglas Noble has um, pre-recorded um, before she starts. And Lisa Sinclair, Senior Dance Health Manager at Scottish Ballet, um, is talking about time to dance and uh, Scottish ballet duet and more. 
And Bishaka Saka, Artistic Director of Shadarangan, um, is absolutely passionate about live, street, live dance streaming for care homes. Finally, we shall show an irresistible YouTube from Shanghai. China sadly proving impenetrable, this two minute clip gives a glimpse of live streaming out of a care home, led by Tiao Yihao, Vice President of the Social Welfare Institute at Yangpe Yangpu District. You're never too old to be a pinup girl. And Muir will summarize as chair and we end at 2 p.m. GMT. So let's start with Martin's recording. And as this closes with warmest thanks, hand over to Simeon to chair the webinar. I use VR a lot, and it came about purely by accident. One day I was having a foggy day, and Alzheimer's Scotland were having a technology day nearby, so we went along, and I saw the VR headset, and as, an, as I've always been an IT geek, I thought I'd try it out. So I sat down, put on the headset, and a whale suddenly came towards me. My brain suddenly became alive and everyone in the room was watching and they could see my body straighten up. And so I actually did a virtual bike ride on my daughter's exercise bike to London and back and bought the local Alzheimer's group a VR headset and computer, which is still have to this day. And then after COVID, Alzheimer's Scotland got back in touch with me and they've actually given me an Oculus headset with two controllers and that's all you need. You don't, the two controllers set up the space for you to, for whatever, whatever word, play about in. All right, so when I have a foggy day, I go on it and I'll go and look at places where I've been. For instance, I've been on safari, so I'll go to Kenya and it's just as if you're there. You can reach out and kind of, if you like, stroke the lion, which obviously you never do in real life, but it's there for you to do. And I just go to places where I've been on holiday. That's how I use it. However, it's mainly used in art for 3D drawing. You put out one of your hands with a controller and you can draw 3D pictures and things like that. There's also 3D games, but because I've got posterior cortical atrophy, I don't have any perception. So it, that kind of game is no use to me. However, it is very useful. And with Alzheimer's Scotland, I will soon be going up to their outdoor resource center where we'll be filming a VR film of their outdoor resource center. So we, people can look, say, put on the VR headset and look as if they're there. And hopefully it'll be good because kind of nature is always calming and it's especially calming if you're in it, but still saying on an armchair or something. Muir, thank you very much, Martin. Well, a wonderful testimony there to the third healthcare revolution. So we've had two healthcare revolutions. One is the public health revolution of the 19th century, which brought us clean, clear water. The second has been the high tech revolution of the last 50 years. It's just astonishing what's happened. Transplantation, MRI, uh, hip replacement, these are amazing things, but they've got their limitations. Now we need the first and second revolutions to continue, but we're now in the third healthcare revolution, driven by three forces, citizens, knowledge, and the internet. And today's workshop, we've brought together a range of people who are using, let's call it digital. I don't particularly like the word Tim Berners-Lee was asked in 2000 what was his 10-year ambition, and he said that no one used the word the internet in 10 years' time. And same with digital. We don't talk about electricity, healthcare, uh, but digital is, will do us for the moment. Now, we're not for the moment suggesting that people with Alzheimer's or any health problem, or any of us, do not need more face-to-face, -face, direct contact, 
more hugging, more direct stimulation. So our first speaker is, I'll keep my specs on so I can see the, um, the mute button. Our first speaker is Charles King, who's taken technology, uh, developed for another purpose, and transformed it. Charles, over to you. Thank you, Leo. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles King. Uh, I'm CEO of Rover Systems. And uh, we are involved with providing VR activity therapies. It's very much like what Marty was talking about. But we're taking it a little bit further than that. And we're very interested in the physical, emotional, and cognitive uh, activity therapies. So dealing with both the body, the, the social connections, and, and keeping the mind active. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just take you through a brief uh, group of, of slides which we've taken in more recent uh, times. We work with care homes, we're in hospital, uh, and, and we're just starting to go into hospices as well. Uh, and, and here we can see our Rover Relief product, um, where we have companionable, really interested in companionable conversations and reminiscences. This, these are 360 videos, so the person wearing the headset can look all around them, and the person who's holding a tablet can see what they are seeing. And as a consequence, it's like two people going to a viewpoint and looking out and having some shared reference point to look at and to chat and to, to, to discuss together. Um, and that's a really important aspect, but particularly with this, it enables people to people watch and to become part of life again. Oftentimes we find people have, feel they're separated from life by placing them in, in these environments, they can feel part of that life again. They can be part of an audience uh, at a theatre or at an opera. Uh, they can actually watch people play music and be part of the audience there uh, and, and not be reliant on a director's, you know, a, a kind of BBC or, or a channel director's whim of how long they stay on anybody. They can look anywhere they like. So uh, we move on from uh, seated VR experiences to active VR experiences, and these are very much social. So this is intended to generate unwitting exercise for people who would normally um, may not exercise at all. It may be brought down from, uh, from uh, their bedroom and, and, and placed in their chair and may sit there for most of the day. So they may actually not do more than about 100 steps a day. And yet we have found we can encourage people to walk up to three kilometers. So we've had people in care homes walk up to three kilometers. And what they're doing is they're sliding their feet backwards and forwards. It's exercising all the muscles associated with the knee. And it strengthens those muscles. And perhaps if they're not going to walk uh, again, well, then it keeps that lower body exercised. It, it also helps um, uh, potentially gain the movement uh, it, for full walking. Um, we have here a lady who's in Oxford. Um, she's actually walking. She walked continuously. She's 87 years old. She walked continuously for one hour while she was chatting with a carer in Cornwall, that's 200 miles away, and another friend in West Sussex. And all of them were walking and chatting together as they walked through a, a, a scene. Uh, and, and so this was social connection. Uh, this lady was absolutely mesmerized by being somewhere different, chatting and talking to other people, totally unwitting exercise. And at the end of that hour, she complained that her legs hurt. And that was, that was absolutely brilliant because we've actually strengthened some muscles there. Unfortunately, there's no gain without a little bit of pain if you're going to strengthen your muscles. Uh, here we have the next stage on. So we, we've come from seated VR to seated active VR to now fully mobile VR. And here we have a lady, uh, our oldest participant at present of 103 years old, and she's walking around the place down in Cornwall. Uh, she's in a she's in an assisted living uh, setting. Uh, uh, Joyce is uh, walking around a place called Maker Heights. It's a World War II redoubt fort on the Cornish coast with all the sounds of the birds and the sea and the spectacular viewpoint looking out over, over Plymouth. Um, and it was an 
opportunity to work with others. And these social, both the seated active and this, and this fully uh, mobile active VR, you can see she's standing in, a, in a, um, a treadmill here. And I can show you those treadmills a little better um, uh, in the next couple of slides. But essentially what they do is, is that they're able to walk forever and with other people. They don't have to be in the same country. People can join either from a laptop or from another VR headset from anywhere else in the world. And you can see uh, we've got a, a gentleman here doing this and then other members of the family who are younger, the next generations down. This is cross-generational and opens the opportunity for those sandwich generations who, who would love to be with their parents but are, are also have responsibilities for children. And maybe they can have a walk with their parent without actually having to go and visit them on every occasion. Uh, maybe a walk once a day. So that's us, that's what we do. We're activity therapies, social cognitively stimulating uh, to, to try and help people live longer, better. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles, terrific. And um, this brings up the issue that we've been discussing. Maybe everybody who gets admitted to a care home uh, should have their favorite reading and their favorite music recorded. Because Charles has shown that if you play music that's relevant to somebody, you reach some part of their brain and get terrific response. Uh, now the same applies to people in their own homes. Maybe every GP should record um, the person's favorite music, favorite books, favorite type of program, favorite hobbies, and we can do digital social prescribing. So here's an example of revolutionary technology. Now our next two speakers are very respectable revolutionaries, uh, and there's some great people emerging now. And I was terrifically impressed when I first met Khalid and Michael, and they are in Winchester, they're ex-BBC, uh, but what they're doing, they've identified the fact that more, in a significant proportion of care homes, the only internet connection is in the office and in some big television stuck in the lounge that no one really knows how to work. So as well as uh, the the message, they are thinking a lot like Charles about the medium. So Khalid, I think you're you're on first. Khalid, are you are you there? I am indeed. Thank you, uh, Mia. It's uh, good to be with everyone today. I mean, I was uh, very honoured to be invited by Michael Blackstad, who you'll hear from later, to chair what was a seminar designed at really drawing together all the technologies and all the thinking the technologies such as the brilliant stuff we've just seen and we can see it's very effective and we also drew uh, amongst our number people who had really studied this whole business of of dementia and uh, without going through all the findings i'll just just give you my takeaways because i was very much the lay person there um, I have had no real experience of dementia, but of course we all know what it's like to visit someone. And what really struck me was that often there are awkward conversations. If you see somebody in hospital who hasn't got uh, dementia or in a care home who hasn't got dementia, you, you have a conversation which goes around, um, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. Um, what have you been doing today? Well, not much, because I've been stuck in this bed or this chair. Um, and then uh, the visitor is really rather struck for a stuck for something next to say. And of course, what one really wants is some point of mutuality, the sort of thing you saw just there from Charles's uh, fantastic uh, presentation of his technology, where you are both experiencing something together. What was also clear from our seminar was that there's something called the reminiscence bump. We tend to form our memories, apparently, during the ages of 15 to 30. And the reason behind that is because that's when most of our change takes place in our lives. We become adults, we leave home, we go out to work, we probably form a romantic liaisons, we may even get married and so on. And those are the bits that stick apparently with people who have dementia longest. 
And those are the things that are still there when short term memory has disappeared. And so if you can pull together the reminiscent bump appropriate uh, clips of whether it's video, cinema, even adverts, people can remember adverts, you know, for MASH get smash and your shaken back adverts and all those sorts of things. Um, that stimulates all sorts of memories. And what they discovered also, it doesn't have to be too tailored in some cases. Just a picture of anyone on a beach can stimulate memories of the person with dementia who can remember suddenly when they were on a beach and they can talk about that too. And what struck me was that if you could absolutely get this going, because one of the big resistances, of course, care home staff are greatly under pressure. There aren't enough of them, you know, and so on. But actually it would, to use a bit of the jargon, it would greatly expand the dwell time of people who visit their relatives with dementia because they've got things to do with them as opposed to things to do at them. Uh, and all of this, I mean, I, I came away hugely enthused by the possibilities of, sorry to use this awful word, of, of not just warehousing people with dementia, but actually helping them live better lives. And I know with all the charities I've been involved with, uh, particularly the ones uh, to do with disability, it is all really about us as uh, society, ensuring people can live the best lives they possibly can. The real barriers, and I'm sure Michael Blackstad will, will say even more on this, is trying to get the connectivity there. There are all sorts of resources around, Charles's organization, the BBC has an archive of uh, copyright free and certainly uh, payment free material that can be used. There's all sorts of things around, but the real sticking point is connection, connectivity. And that's what we've got to get over. We had people at our seminar also from care homes. They are struggling just to keep their homes open and solvent. So whatever happens from here on in, the solution has to include a way of communicating the benefits of this. And it would seem to me that just as we have had in education, um, the revolution of having teaching assistants and parents coming in to do reading, extra reading with children, we could actually augment the care, help the paid carers go further if we could make it so much easier for visitors to their relations with dementia to stay there longer using technology and using connectivity. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful. And, uh... Khalid and uh, Michael, uh, I think you were your colleagues together a number of years ago. Uh, by the way, we're, yes, Khalid? No, no, no I say we, we kind of were in the BBC. Everybody assumes that everybody in the BBC knows each other. We, we were in the BBC at the same time, but our paths didn't quite uh, cross. Um, I was at one stage going to be uh, the presenter of um, a very famous programme, which Michael established called um, Tomorrow's World. Um, but we, but that was long after Michael had left. So, uh, but then we were colleagues together in in ITV when we both went uh, to Television South. So we did actually then work together. Yeah. Well, I think uh, by the way, we're, one of our moves is to do away with the word retirement. It's called Renaissance, and um, so it's a fine for using the word retirement. To say so, <laughs> we're we're speaking to people who are having renaissances, and one of them is Michael Blackstad, and Michael's inspired me by his uh, strategic, his detailed knowledge of the challenge that people with Alzheimer's and other others face, but his ability to relate that to a strategic approach. Uh, and it was Michael who in initiated the meeting in Winchester, which led to this connectivity issue. It's the medium and the message, remember. So we've got lots of messages, but we need the medium. Michael, over to you, please. Well, thank you for those kind words and thank you, Khalid covering the ground that I was planning not to cover, so I don't need to anymore, thank you. Um, my story begins in a strange way. Um, I was having lunch one day, or planning to have lunch. My carer brings me lunch at one o'clock, so I can watch the one o'clock news. And instead of getting the program, we got this message followed by this. And she has her own mobile phone, followed by this. It's nice and easy, she says. It isn't when you've got shaky hands and you can't read the code. So to cut a long story short, 
in quarter of an hour's time. I just got in, I'd missed the lunch and I'd missed the news. David Attenborough may be good at this sort of thing, but I'm not. And it really brought hope to, to me how very difficult it is to operate today's technology. And I haven't got dementia, I may have Parkinson, I don't have dementia. It's totally impossible for people with dementia to get through to television. And when they do, the content isn't there and they don't know what they're going to watch. And they don't watch it in time. Um, my wife went into a care home in Hampshire in, um, in July 1920, just, 2020, just after the lockdown, and she had a torrid time. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit of um, I went in with her. I went to, um, to There's an example of community activity that's even better for me here. Um, Trisha sat in her room with nothing happening on the telly and it's just totally useless to her. And then I went to another care home and um, because Trisha had to be moved on because her dementia got worse. And there they had the same thing, had these wretched channels which sit there with nothing suitable hundreds of channels suited to international business yeah. and for me remote controls that people can't operate. So I formulated this phrase, media versus dementia. I'm afraid I went against the advice which you obviously observed of using the word versus instead of for, but I'm not for dementia, I'm against it and we're battling with this. Um, we're launching our website soon and I'd just like to take up Muir's point on the business of media. Um, Media, I'm a classicist, and I hate the word media used in the singular to describe the fourth estate, everything to do with mass communication, newspaper, radio, television, and the rest of it, um, as though it was a thing. Um, whereas in fact, media, as all you good people know, is a lot of media, any means of communicating with people, whether it's VR, whether it's music, whether it's audio, whether it's TV. Um, and the people could interact back. And that's where I start. This has got to be an interactive business. Um, I decided we would form the English Garden, taking the phrase from Victorians, which um, is basically uh, a peace place of horticultural peace and protection, in which residents may collect and play their favourite media, music, audio, content, memory, and make it their favourite. They've got to be able to play it when they want to, play it again if they want to, and so that is the favourite. So I called a seminar, which um, Muir and Kajika Charles and Carly Fee kindly attended. It was a fantastic event. The guy on the screen is the head of BBC Archive content, and they are there, they are with us. And at the end of the day, they all vowed that they should take this forward, that the Walt Garden should indeed be formed. We came up with this three groups, loosely um, divided into a horticultural section, the gardeners of the scientists, the, um, the flower beds or where the content grows, and the technology is a bit unreal. It's a jukebox because we need something, as Muir said, you don't see the technology, you don't mention the web digital, it's just got to get there because people want to and so you don't need a care. So, um, we came up with three important things and lots of others. One was reminiscence theory, which Carl had mentioned, the reminiscence bump. Everybody knows that people lose their short-term memory first, long-term first. What they didn't know is that it takes a, it, it can be really un unlikely content that brings up really unlikely memories. Then the BBC suggested an iPlayer equivalent, a memory channel. And finally, in the technology area, we need an app. And that's where we're heading next. Um, I, w I went to a dementia-friendly performance of um, Crazy for You, a musical at Chichester recently. I went to one at the National Theatre as well. And I realised that it was a wonderful occasion, but the people there were very early in their dementia and nobody was really measuring how far their dementia had caught or anything else. So the next stage is to think about the... Um, the, the stages at which dementia happens, we don't know enough about it and we need to study it. For instance, Trisha, by this time, this is my wife, um, was beginning to 
repeat what she said over and over again, Michael and Sophie. And that's basically what happens in dementia. She does do some artistic activity. She was an artist, she was an architect, um, but she don't be pretending wrong to say it's meaningful, but she can also understand it when the Khan and Bunja brought her into a catalogue of the Bolivia's program exhibition that was in Winchester. She loved Bolivia's. But what is she, what are we to do? in terms of genuinely communicating, what are the content that we need to create, what are the performances that we get through to them. Um, the, I got, the BBC very kindly supplied me with some footage of film which I had made. And it was... How are we doing? And we also um, gave her a VR experience. Charles very kindly came over and put the camera on her, tried to, and she took it all. It did lift her a bit. Both experiences lifted her. I cannot say they made a huge amount of difference, but then she was very far gone. So we want to get the, the range of the dementia activities. We want to find out which bits of media appeal to the most and how they can access the most easily. This was. Um, some of you may have heard the Today program three weeks ago. Trisha unfortunately died a month ago today, and um, we had a funeral last week. And I was able to get her one last experience of. So we need to get connectivity in every care home. We want to get carers who can actually operate the equipment and do it well. And we need to get content that suits them. That's the mission. And I hope very much that VR will play a large part in that. Thank you. Michael, wonderful. And I think when Charles uh, was uh, playing uh, or using the VR with, with Sophie, there was a, as he moved from one, one VR to another, there was some tinkly music. And um, she suddenly said, in the midst of a stream of Sophie Michael, she suddenly said, I think Charles, that's not very complex music, is it? So something had been reached in, in that way. That's uh, so, uh, the revolution is underway, and we'll come back with questions to Michael and Kavi. I love it. Media versus dementia. Good, solid Latin all the way through, Michael. <laughs> so our next presenter is Claire Sandikov. And so, Claire, over to you, please. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here today. And um, thank you for that, for that Michael. Um, I love the idea of the wall garden. Sounds excellent. Um, firstly, to, for, to share the background on what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it all came about from 5G. Um, it's a test bed and trial program set up by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, to fund projects that explored how 5G could technology um, could influence um, people's experiences. Our project entitled Eden Universe was one of the nine 
that won a DCMS bid to explore how, how 5G networks could enhance people's lives. We were delighted to be selected to take part in such an exciting project. Trial how 5G could enhance the Eden experience, both at our site in Cornwall and online, reaching different audiences, both locally and globally. The whole journey was a fantastic opportunity to work with new technologies and new partners to explore innovations for the future. Now I'm going to quickly share my screen. If you haven't been to the Eden project, this is what we were trying to bring to life through different two different audiences, both globally and locally. This is the one of the outputs of virtual tour. I'll come back to that if I've got more time at the end. Um, we work with a range of partners to create, deliver and evaluate our content. One was Marshmallow Laser Feast. They created amazing augmented reality experiences. We worked with Meta Camera, who installed seven 360 degree cameras into our biomes, both the rainforest biome and the Mediterranean. And we worked with AQL, who are, were our 5G provider. We were also very excited to work with the University of Plymouth GOLD team, GOLD standing for Generating Older Active Lives Digitally. They collaborated with us on the evaluation of the health and well-being aspect of the trial. More on that shortly. So at Eden Project Cornwall, we installed the 5G network and supporting fibre infrastructure. We developed a range of digital experiences to test how 5G could align with our mission, which is all about connecting people to each other and the living world. We created four exemplars to connect with different audience groups. One was for visitors on site and online, health and well-being in care homes, education in schools and art and culture online. Across a four month period, we trialled and evaluated the experiences and shared our findings with DCMS. And today I'm going to expand a bit more on our health and well-being exemplar. An objective from the start of the project was to understand whether taking a virtual Eden into care homes had an effect on health and well-being in the residents of these care homes. In what way could a digital experience of Eden enhance the sense of connection to the natural world and to other people? Could it provide new conversations to have with fellow residents in care homes, care home staff and family members? In what way could it influence mood and sleep? And also very importantly to test whether or not we can provide an opportunity for lifelong learning to learn something new whatever age you are. Collaborating with the University of Plymouth allowed us to be part of a much bigger research program, which was very exciting for us. As I said, we teamed up with the GOLD team, generating older active lives digitally. And it, this is a project that's run by universities of Stirling and Plymouth. And their overall aims is to bring older and younger adults together to explore the use of digital health technologies. Sorry, now I'm using language that you know, maybe we have to change, but um, <laughs> it's in my script, so, <laughs> um, so I, I've written a note to myself. Um, they know from literature and previous research, there's a lot of support to, um, for the health and well-being benefits um, that can be had from physically visiting sites like Cornwall, but obviously there's groups that can't do that. So to be able to find new ways to visit culture attractions like Eden, this for them was a great opportunity to um, evaluate this. In terms of content developed, we created a virtual tour of the Eden Project in Cornwall, which in included amazing AR experiences set in our rainforest biome. And this was called the Invisible Rainforest. This made up of three different experiences, one of which was the weather maker. And this is an, an experience viewed through one of the 360 degree cameras, which climbed and descended one of the biggest three trees in our rainforest biome. Um, we also had other cameras live streaming across the biomes. We had a 20 minute virtual nature experience that featured the dawn chorus at sunrise set in Eden's outdoor gardens. There was re really special content was delivered across three different technologies. And those were an iPad with headsets. And this accessed the virtual, virtual tour along with the AR content a room with what, what we called a room with a view. And this is where we had a large projector screen 
set up with all lovely um, Eden plants to give it a real sense of nature. And, and what, there was an experience with VR headsets. And for the virtual reality headsets, we created three additional pieces of content. And it was literally like a VIP tour of Eden through the outdoor gardens, the, another film of six minutes in length, the rainforest biome, and a third, the Mediterranean um, uh, biome. Uh, and we also had the virtual nature experience, which included the dawn chorus. Um, three homes, um, Cornwall, three Cornwall care homes took part in the trials and each had one of the, um, one of the technologies to see how their residents um, got on with it. Um, in setting up the experiences in the care homes, we provided the staff with training. This involved them showing them how to use the equipment and a guide to each of the experience. So when they sat down with their residents on a weekly basis, they had like, you know, kind of tasks to take them through. So um, everybody knew what was going on each week. Activity leaders in each of the care homes delivered the experiences from us. At the start, they found that the use of the equipment took a little bit of time, but very quickly the residents um, were able to find their own way around to the gardens, find out new bits of information in the rainforest biome. And for a lot of um, the residents, for not all of them, but for some of them, it inspired them to learn uh, more about the different waterfalls around the world. Um, some re um, residents thought it was a lovely, peaceful experience. It was so nice for them to see the different images. It was a relaxing experience they found. And um, some said they absolutely loved it and it made them feel really happy. We're now looking to future proof these um, experiences to use specifically in, within community groups such as care homes. The assets that we have will be handed over to the ex 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 wider Eden team and we will be looking to develop and deploy alongside our other various work streams. So that is Eden Universe in a nutshell. I've just skimmed the surface and I haven't showed you any content, but um, I hope that gives you a sense for what it was all about. Wonderful. So the Eden, Eden project, I think it epitomizes this possibility. So we can give people reminiscence and um, the BBC has got plenty of reminiscence, Dr. Finley's case book, for example. Uh, we can give people uh, foreign travel and we can give them uh, nature. And, and Charles and I are discussing actually whether we shouldn't, uh, in our work in Oxfordshire, adopt the, the, the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire Wildlife Trust whether these people who are moving their feet couldn't be raising money to tackle climate change and create jobs for young people. So we're thinking of ways in which we can not only provide stimulation, but also what seems to be very important. And I think it's very important not to write people off who've got dementia. And the, it's clear now that lack of purpose and the feeling of of uselessness accelerates decline. So I think the Eden Project would epitomize where we want people to look. To, certainly we want to look at foreign cities and look at the, where you were brought up. But I think this idea of, of the future, uh, climate change, and thinking of future generations is very powerful for people with dementia. So thank you very much for that. And no, you're welcome. And now, um, uh, Nigeria uh, is just intellectually such a stimulating place. I'm working a bit with healthcare in Nigeria. And our speaker now, Kunle Adewale, is at the Institute of Brain Health in Nigeria. And I think actually, the, this thing called, called digital took place faster in Africa than uh, in England, in many parts of England. Partly, I think, because you bypassed wire, didn't you? I mean, you moved more directly to communication. So there's a lot to learn, and we're going to hear some from Kunle. Kunle, over to you, please. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it is with great delight to join all of you here today. And I'm going to be talking about a uh, virtual reality program in Nigeria. And, um, okay, all right, excellent. 
So uh, uh, my focus today is um, the creativity and um, digital equity for um, Nigerian um, seniors. So Nigeria is described as a culturally and environmentally diverse and, and a lower in the, uh, middle income country in the sub-Saharan Africa with over 200 million population. And of course, it is currently the seventh uh, largest country in the world. Amazing, with the fastest uh, population growth. Nigeria is also projected to become the third largest uh, country in the world in 2050. Um, Nigeria has the highest number of older people on the continent of Africa and the 19th highest across the globe with a population of um, Nigerian aged 65 and older projected to nearly triple by 2050. Um, the psychosocial health factors during the aging, pro aging process for the seniors in Nigeria, uh, you know, we can see it based on what we see on the screen. Uh, there's increased uh, demand for healthcare services. Uh, so we have inadequate health prepare healthcare workforce, have sense of elderly friendly services. Uh, we also see the increased economic stress, uh, retirement status, absence of social security system or system for these um, seniors in Nigeria. There's also changes in family dynamics, uh, which include a caregiver stress, elder ab abuse, which is very rampant and very, very, it's a big deal here in Nigeria. We also see there's a decreased functional independence. So there's ch there are changes in functional status and decreased social networks among the elderly uh, people. Uh, the United Nations International Day of Older Person 2021 theme was digital equity for all ages, which predicate the need for access and meaningful participation in digital world by uh, older person. So in creating a fairer and healthier and equitable world, digital technology is fundamental for seniors using virtual reality for the elderly and a vulnerable population will make them enthusiastic about life it will help them to find amazing sparks in their lives. So uh, technology for us is, in, in Nigeria, you realize that a lot of young people are really engaged in using tech, um, the, the virtual reality. You go to, to the malls, so you see young people using it for gaming, entertainment, but including the seniors uh, helps to bridge these uh, intergenerational gaps. So this access promotes social engagement in the homes and helps seniors with their physical, emotional, and well-being. So it helps them to relive the beautiful memories of their favorite places, people, and music locally and globally. So inclusion is part of the well-being package. So how we run our program, so our virtual reality engagement for Nigerian seniors run across these three you know, circles. So we have care home for the elderly. We have elderly group in the community. Also, we have community daycare center for the elderly. So these, these are the three places where we host our virtual reality engagement. Um, these are core uh, areas that we look at in engaging the elderly in Nigeria. We look at the concept of equity. We look at the, you know, area of dignity, diversity, and humanity as well. Uh, we know that access is fundamental. Not everyone can afford to buy the headset. Not everyone can afford to go to the care homes, right? So we we'll find a way around, you know, deploying the headset, you know, facilitating virtual reality engagement across groups, uh, across our communities and across homes as well. Uh, participants in our program include um, from age 60 upward, and this include people living with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, uh, those with cognitive impairment, those uh, stroke patients, uh, among many others. So these are the categories. So we have this wide spectrum of uh, participants in our virtual reality engagement. For us, everything begins with conversation. Everything begins with the conversation. So we, when we go to this home, we don't just impose ideas. We don't just say, we want to do this for you. The first thing we, we do is to just start a conversation. How are you doing today? And then from there, we go to, okay, we would love to share a moment with you. Would you like to experience the virtual reality? And then, so what would you like to do? And then this is a part of, 
you know, part of the things we do is just like you go into a restaurant, right? And they serve jollof rice. There is fried rice. There is plantain. There is beans. There is cocoa yam. So you don't just give somebody fried rice, except the person wants the fried rice. So we don't just give them an experience they don't recommend or they don't really request for. So from the conversation, we are able to know, right? To find out what they really desire to explain the virtual reality. So we provide a wide range of options for seniors based on their preferences. We, we've, we're very intentional about what they want to experience. So um, these are part of the options that we have for them. We have music, we have dance, movement, we have comedy skits, we have movies, we have guided meditation, mindfulness, art, sport, and tourism. You know, you see all of these are part of of the virtual reality experience that the seniors in Nigeria, Lagos and Nigeria specifically, have been enjoying for the past uh, month. Um, what we do basically using virtual reality, so we don't have the funding to hire or to employ in developers, right, to help us to develop new things that the, fellow, the seniors might want to explore. But what we do what we do usually is to buy applications like Helium, like Trip, like, um, of course, we also explore uh, the VR uh, YouTube channel to be able to explore in opportunities for seniors who want to really interact with technology. So apps were purchased to support the virtual reality engagement for Nigerian seniors. Like I said before, Helium, Trip, 11, Table Tennis, Gov, all the applications, including YouTube, all of these are part of what we leverage for the seniors in Nigeria. So what are the challenges that we, we have faced, you know, facilitating, you know, immersive, you know, uh, uh, technological experience for seniors living with dementia, those with cognitive impairment, those with strokes, among many others. So we realize there is, there is the dimension of internet accessibility. So you realize that, you know, Internet is very important for us to use. We use Oculus Quest, uh, Oculus Quest 2 and also Oculus Go. And then we realize that in certain communities like the rural areas, there is no access to internet. And what that means is that they might not be able to experience or have access. So what we do was, what we did was actually was to curate, like downloaded videos and curated them into the VR headset such that, you know, that we can still be able to engage with a senior independent of the internet. So, but we're able to mitigate that challenge with the access to internet. So there's also lack of education. So the use of VR technology requires more education uh, for the staff of the care homes and the residents. The communication barriers is one of the challenges of using VR in the homes in Nigeria. Uh, you agree with me. I mean, Nigeria is one of the just like developing countries in the world, low income uh, country in, in, in the world as well, right? So the use of technology, especially the virtual reality in care homes is very strange, right? So it's not a popular thing. Right? So for us, we, we have taken time to really educate uh, the staff of this care home on how to use the virtual reality and how to navigate and how to deploy it also for some of these seniors. So there's lack of funding for our VR content developers. Like I said before, we don't have content developers. What we do basically is to just leverage the existing digital content and buy applications. So at the asset for the home, currently we have about five assets that we use across um, about seven homes in Lagos, Nigeria. Over 80 to 100 older persons have really experienced a virtual reality program. So the assets are not affordable. So the homes cannot make purchases yet. So each asset, of course, costs about $500. So we currently have five assets. Um, although some of the chaos were inspired by the social engagement, triggered by the VR session, they are making moves and have developed keen, a keen interest in purchasing the asset for their client. One of the things we also we try to look at is the safety checks. So uh, is it safe for the elderly ones to use the VR, right? So the resident and the participant, participants were not introduced to content that will make them feel dizzy or lose mobility. So to avoid the risk of falls and the injury, we stick to digital content they feel comfortable with. So this is very important for us to check that they are okay to use the asset. So we don't just say tick and use. So we, we, we try to check, is this okay for you? Do you want to experience this? We try to do that. So um, I spoke earlier on about lack of education, the use of virtual reality reality asset among the care, the care homes and also so one of the things we try to do is to train the care home staff members on the use of virtual reality for the residents, right? So 
that is one of the things that we try to do. Testimonials from the VR experience of the you know, seniors in Nigeria, including those that are living with dementia. So the VR experience, according to this resident, the VR experience gives me a feeling that I can never forget. So this man that you're seeing on my screen now is the first DJ in Nigeria. He's the first DJ ever in Nigeria. So he's, one, he's, he's, he's in one of the care homes that we work with. And then, so when we spoke with him about, okay, would he like to explain the virtual reality and say, Yes, I would love to. I would love to experience Ray Charles. And then here is he experiencing Ray Charles and the youth in the in the VRS through the YouTube. And he's, you know, he was crying, you know, after a very long time experiencing and seeing Ray Charles live on stage using the asset, he said. The VR experience gives me a feeling that I can never forget. He captured this in the Realtors documentary of our program. Another, another, another senior there said, this is the first time I've seen a VR asset. It is also my first time experiencing it. I stood up to dance when the music entered my brain. It elevated my spirit. Here, a caregiver, a caregiver spoke about the VR experience improving the moods of the seniors. It brought back good memories and they were, and they were more interactive than ever before. These seniors spoke about the experience made them, I mean, the caregiver here spoke about the experience made them happy, excited, and made them feel like people still care. It's also removed for some of depression. Um, let me just skip to the last one. In conclusion, the VR program helped to minimize inequities as participation was open to seniors across classes, tribes, religions, ethnicity, and gender. It destigmatizes dementia and other health conditions associated with aging. The VR program helped to bridge the generational and digital technology gaps by providing access to seniors and care homes, community daycare centers, and early elderly groups in the community through immersive technology. Um, lastly, the VR engagement for Nigerian seniors provide a room to escape loneliness, isolation, anxiety, stigma, and depression associated with aging. Our partners in this program so far has been you know, Helium, Atlantic Institute, Road Trust in the UK, Oxford, Global Brain Health Institute, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Association. Thank you so much. You can just follow us on social media to see more of our engagement. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you all. Great. Superstar, Kunle. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we're going to finish the first hour. I want everyone to stand up for a minute. But while they do, Charles, can I just ask you, are these bloody headsets going to get lighter? So can you answer while everybody um, moves a little bit for the second hour? Charles, over to you for a minute. Okay, yes, they are going to get lighter. Um, the, the technology at present is all based around mobile phone technology. So you have a screen, which is with its electronics to drive it. That's, um, and then you need a battery to run that. And uh, there are some headsets. We, we use Pico headsets. Um, because they balance the electronics at the front and the battery at the rear, and that makes them that makes them lighter. To, it feels lighter to wear. Um, uh, but even the next generation of those are, which are coming out now, Pico Fours, are lighter still than they were. Uh, but the the end game will be when the uh, headsets become uh, pretty much like the uh, glasses that uh, Khalid and I are wearing, for instance. Um, they will be that light. They will be that small. They will use waveguide technology. And I know the people who are working in this area, and I reckon it will be, unfortunately, about for probably five to eight years from now before they'll get there, but we will get there. Great. Okay. It accelerates, so it may be faster, but that's typically, uh, but they will, go, they will go in that direction. Great. Well, tremendous range of speakers. Uh, keep, uh, I want people to put down questions and comments particularly questions and we'll do Veronica and I will deal with these afterwards and I hope you've all had a chance to stretch a bit I've moved over to uh, be with Ludwig he's joining me for the second part <laughs> of the, um, the second part of the workshop and very appropriate because uh, Rosa Corbishley is our first speaker and she was the one who um, <sighs> turned the London Symphony Orchestra from turning up in the Barbican to see it or wherever they're based I think it's the Barbican they're based um, to stream. So, Rosa, are you there and ready to go? 
Okay, can you hear? Hi. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. This is a very uh, wonderful thing, and we're excited to talk about our project. So just a little bit about the organisation. For those who don't know you, Bristol Beacon is a music charity. Uh, we're based in the southwest in Bristol, beautiful city of Brist Bristol. We were formed, we're only quite a new charity, we were formed in 2011 to take on the organization and management of the concert hall then called Colston Hall but we also run a region-wide music education hub and we have a really substantial community and sort of outreach program of which the program I'm here to talk about today is part of. Um, uh, this is a fantastic, I've, I've heard so much from the other speakers today about both programs that um, link profoundly to sort of memory uh, but also then those that are uh, encouraging people to be uh, to people living with dementia to be stimulated and to have new experiences and we like to think that our program with the London Symphony Orchestra is in fact providing the two sides so I'll describe a little bit about what we've done and then how it came about and um, if anybody would like to ask any questions we would I would love to answer them. So essentially our program um, was a partnership between the London Symphony Orchestra. Um, Simon Rattle was very prominent in the conversation as well initially. Um, it was with a, a care home group. It started with a particular care home group in um, a Bristol with a very enlightened a sort of owner operator. Um, it also importantly had a connection with the CQC. We felt that was a really great opportunity and, um, and Yes, and, and it's the context just to to describe it is that um, also, yes, we're the, a, a music charity and we run a concert hall, but we're right in the middle of um, a major capital program. So we're due to open a new concert building next year, 20, uh, 2023. And so, in fact, this concert happened in Bath at our, our um, yes, CQC, Care Quality Commission. Thanks, Veronica. Um, uh, this happened in Bath and we often put our shows on, uh, we promote shows into Bath Forum, so Bath Forum were part of the story as well. Um, what we did was uh, develop a programme with uh, Simon Rattle and with the wonderful team there, Tim and Andra, um, that we thought would both be pull on people's reminiscences. So the, the, the first program we did together was Beethoven 6, but then they also wanted to have um, wonderful new works or newer works in here. So we also had a viola concerto by Martineau. And this, uh, we promoted the live stream really heavily um, using CQC's networks. We also developed a number of partnerships across the country with care home groups. We tended to focus on groups because obviously it can reach multiple, um, uh, multiple points through through care home groups and it was very interesting to hear Michael talking about um, internet access uh, we were very had to be very very considered about how we promoted multiple routes in to the live stream so people could look at it on any platform and I've got some lovely photos to show you of a care home that looked at it the the the, organize, the, the care homes organizer put it on a big screen in the central space. And so we had a lot of people doing that, but we also had individuals looking at it on tablets and we know people looked at it on phones as well. Um, so any route through, frankly, we were excited about. Um, it, it came at a particular time, Simon Rattle and the chief executive here, Louise, were always really clear um, yes, uh, it was really clear that this was, it was a thank you, not only for those residents we're living with dementia in care homes, but also the people who looked after them through the pandemic. So the initial one that happened was a real response to the pandemic and people were very excited about online, but we've actually discovered that it's been a very valuable way to, to offer music on a mass scale, uh, at a national level at the highest, highest quality. And obviously we're working with partners that represent the highest quality through the London Symphony Orchestra. So how did it come about? We're incredibly lucky to have um, the care home owner, Jeff Crocker, who, who owns four care homes across the city of Bristol. Um, and it was actually really came out of a, a really passionate idea of his that he wanted to, um, he knew that we had um, concerts and events with the LSO and he wanted to get that opportunity into care homes. And in fact, he helped us to think really big and funded most of the work of the care of the, um, the live stream. And we're delighted to say that the work has continued. Um, um, 
<laughs> the, the work has con continued right. and we're due to present yeah, yeah, our, our third like, one in March next year. Um, yes, I mean, that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to show you some quick photos, if, if I possibly could. It'll take two seconds. Uh, doesn't want to show me. So we have a, some wonderful photos of care home residents viewing them in um in in their sort of common shared common space simon and we've got a page here that's got the captured the first bit of it um and it was very much an idea of saying thank you to people who've been on the front line so i can stop there yeah because simon rattle is the great is always goes for the best possible music delivery but um Mior, if you if you have if it's i don't yeah, know let's, uh, if we could have these to these pictures you've got, I'd love to use when we were giving talks and persuading others. So if these could be made available, that'd be great. Of course, I'll do that. Of course. I think also we've been discussing virtual communities. So probably in every care home, there's somebody who really loves Beethoven. But people who really love Benjamin Britten is probably 1.78 care homes. And people love, <laughs> people love bagpipes, one for every 32.6 care homes. But there's something about developing virtual communities of people to have a chat after the concert. Mm -hmm. That's what we're working on too. And Charles mm. technology can, can do that. So you, you go to the concert and then we'll have a cup of tea or a drink afterwards and a chat. Uh, because mm. people are, That's nice. Yeah. We did some of those in, in lockdown as well. And they worked very, very well because exactly that recreates the experience of being at a concert, doesn't it? It's what we all yeah. love. It's a social experience. Social experience. Great. Now on to Nottingham and Nottingham City Arts. Uh, Susanna Bedford and Jim. Susanna, are you ready to go? I am. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to talk today. Um, so I'm Susanna Bedford and I'm the CEO and Creative Director of City Arts and I'm very grateful to my colleague um, Jo who's um, kindly going to take us through um, the Armchair Gallery app which we're here to talk about today. Um, this is an accessible app that's been designed for tablets and it's a great and free resource for carers who are working in residential homes. The wonderful thing about um, the Armchair Gallery is that it brings arts and culture to you. So it enables residents of care homes to effectively be taken out um, into six world-class venues. So we worked with Yorkshire Sculpture Park, Chatsworth House, the Lowry Gallery, Dulwich Picture Gallery, National Trust property, Mr. Straw's house, and Eustace Abbey. And we've got uh, Pitt Rivers Museum as well. Um, and what's really incredible about this is that um, you, you get a very personal welcome um, into these in, in wonderful venues. So if you click onto Chats with House, it feels like you're personally being welcomed by the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire to their home and to their amazing collection at Chats with House. <laughs> this is just a little bit of the intro. So it really just makes you feel like you're there. I think this really just gives a sense of you being brought well, out. Thanks. Um but so the app it gives several activities for each venue. So if you're a carer and you've got this great resource, then you can choose to focus on an artifact or an artwork. And this gives you the opportunity to even have a talk um, and gives you an interactive element. So um, each featured artifact, so for instance, we just saw a lovely kind of, you know, veiled marble sculpture there. Um, and you can actually go into that sculpture and you can choose to have a very sort of close detail look at it and it's it's really beautiful sort of 3D I don't know whether you can show that um Joe um but this just gives you an idea of, of what you would see 
And so each featured artifact like this across all the different venues um, has a whole step by step guide so you can run a structured workshop with um, an either one to one or in a group. Um, and we'd advise that carers just kind of look through each venue to select activities because I think there are about 18 activities across the six venues. So this is a wonderful example. Um, this is a portrait in the, the Chatsworth um, house section. And so you, you could kind of, as a carer, you can look at, assess the level of difficulty. Um, there are various different activities um, with some pre-planning materials <coughs> and um, a bit of thought as to what you'd like to achieve from this workshop. But we have to say that the methodology behind the activities is, is really as dementia friendly. Um, they were designed by an artist called Claire Ford, who actually spent time um, as an artist in residence in a care home herself. So she is has very much designed these activities. I think it's fair to say, um, you know, as kind of closely sort of participant led as possible. And the various different activities are really focused around using the artworks and that kind of idea of going into a venue is a sort of stimulation really for the senses um, to, to encourage people to connect um, on, on uh, many different fronts. So you can use this app um, to eventually tune into a different venue each week. So you could even run a, a kind of a course, if you like, of activities um, over several weeks. There is a training resource um, that Claire has made um, for carers. And um, we, we can kind of put the link in the chat um, for you. As I say, this is for um, iPads and tablets, so not for mobile phones. Um, it can't be accessed via a website link as it's an app, but you can run the app through an iPad, um, through a TV, you know, if you, you kind of buy an adapter and you're as technically capable as, as Joe is, that's not me. Um, and this would allow you to project um, this wonderful app as though it were being live streamed. But I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm that's happy wonderful. to take any questions. That's uh, wonderful. And uh, Joe, thank you for putting the, the links up. And uh, after the seminar is over and we've all gathered in the pub, I'm going to buy you all um, a, a, probably a double gin, so it's on me. Uh, but particularly for the Nottingham team to meet Charles King. Because what we'd like is for people to get up and walk and walk upstairs from in the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, and I think that the, the, the way you've thought this out, if we could add Charles, if we could add the VR into that, but Martin's already raised this as an issue, um, I think it'd be even more suitable, uh, even more impactful. So you could walk and climb stairs as you move from exhibit to exhibit, talking to your niece in Toronto, or you do so. Great, let's move on. We'll have time for discussion and uh, we're back to music. And uh, uh, music, I mean, uh, I think we must be very broad about music. I would like a Chris Barber concert, for example, as well as Beethoven. So we're thinking of all sorts of music and there'll be uh, one Chris Barber fan in every two care homes, I would guess, maybe more. And our, uh, Sophie, Sophie Dunn and Douglas Noble, they've developed life music live music now in the southwest sophie i think you're going to you're going to present sophie are you there great music going live streaming and live, you're there. Music, yeah. live music now so as many of you i'm sure know we are a national charity we work in wales england and northern ireland and there's a sister organization live music now scotland and we work towards social impact through music, which is supporting the musical lives of people experiencing challenging circumstances through disadvantage and social exclusion. We develop and support the musical workforce of professional musicians, and we advocate and evidence the transformative benefits of music 
um, on learning, development, health and well-being. Our musicians are our most important asset and we very carefully select and train them and it's really important to us that they represent the diversity of the communities and the rich musical landscape of the United Kingdom. You can find out more about our musicians and us through that link and QR code below. So like many organisations in early 2020 we found we could no longer work in person overnight and very quickly developed from being a live delivery organization into being a production organization. And out of that, three types of live streaming, live music for people living with dementia and the people supporting them emerged. The first was live music concerts. The second was interactive workshops, which we've always done a lot of interactive work. And the third was workforce and sector development and support. So I'll talk about them in turn, bit of a whistle stop tour to fit it into five minutes, but it'll give you a taste of what we do and did. So live music concerts, here's a few examples. We had regular Facebook live concerts called Live Music in Care for care homes. Uh, on Wednesday lunch times, we had community concerts aimed at people living independently in the community with support organisations, our Songs and Scones programme, and we also had wellbeing uh, concerts for staff working in hospitals, this one with uh, the Bristol NHS Trust. Just an example of some of the things that we did. We also did our, or carried on with our interactive participatory workshops, uh, agency and choice and control are very important parts of our practice. And this is Apple Blossom Lodge, where we worked with men living with dementia on a one-to-one -one basis, as well as in small groups. And it was with a musician called Louis McTaggart, McTaggart and included music making on iPads. And there's a couple of nice quotes there from the staff team that we worked with. Here's also another example. This is Flute Shake live online uh, musical workshops at Chevelton Lodge Care Home in London. So workforce and sector development are always very important to our, our practice. And we ran a large gathering online with over 70 people, musicians, support workers, care workers, as well as people living with them, dementia themselves. It was an opportunity to try and support music to carry on, but also to find out something about the needs that could be met in terms of making that happen and supporting that to happen around the need for information and guidance. This came back from the audience. Um, staff support, training, encouragement needed and technical support and digital know-how and equipment. Learning and challenges were well, lots of technical challenges as I'm sure other people found. Um, so we ran webinars to support uh, musicians around tech and production. We also found that enormous development took place in care workers through necessity in the face of the lockdown and they got confident in using technology to get online and to be able to access things. It was a real testament to their self-sufficiency and ingenuity. Audience development is a always difficult for us as a national organisation and also it was such a full landscape, landscape, so much choice, so we rely very heavily on local and regional partners and our interactive practice was limited, although that really developed and the use of things like music tech, iPad as instruments and the ways that we worked with and engaged and got support from care teams was really key and always will continue to be so. Something on our impact, we were really light touch around our evaluation. We didn't want to make demands, but we gave the opportunity for people to give feedback and they did. And this is around the impact on mood of our online interactive sessions and it shows uh, you know, it, positive impact on mood generally, but also both from before to after taking part in our sessions. So what's the future for live streaming for live music now? Obviously now we can get back in person, we're putting our time, effort and resources into that, but we will carry on live streaming. So workforce development webinars will carry on both for our musicians and for staff teams working in care homes. And there's potential to develop more regular live concerts. We have a model that we do with schools called Musical Mondays. And of course, we're ready to respond to the circumstances, any circumstances that might come along and prevent us working in person in the future. I'm going to leave you with a few quotes, nice kind of responses from people that we work with in respect of our live uh, streaming program that just speak for themselves. And one there from our sister organisation in Scotland. So I've been Douglas Noble, Strategic Director of Adult Social Care and Health for Live Music Now. This is my email address um, and I'd be really happy to hear from you if you want to get in touch.
That was a wonderful pre presentation, and we'll, 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 it looks like we're going to have time for discussion. A couple of points emerging now. One is uh, how do we bring these together and with uh, a light touch? And I was speaking to the editor of the Caring Times uh, mag magazine today, and there are two other magazines go. So I think Veronica, you and I need to just pull these things together. There are probably others we haven't got involved. And the second um, is deafness. Um, and uh, thinking about adapting this for individuals with visual and hearing problems. So we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps address that in a, a separate workshop, but it may be that some of you could comment on that in the, the chat room. Great. Um, live music now. Now, on from music to, to dance. And Lisa from uh, Scottish Ballet, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for that lovely introduction. It's so great to be here today and to be connected with such an inspiring group of people and organisations. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak about Scottish Ballet's programmes. My name is Lisa and I'm Senior Dance Health Manager at Scottish Ballet. We are Scotland's national dance company and the mission is to inspire on stage and beyond, which is incredibly important to the work that we do, particularly within our engagement department. My role oversees the dance health team and with that three neurological programmes, Dance with Parkinson's, our MS programme Elevate and our dementia friendly programme Time to Dance, as well as our research committee and training, wellbeing resources for health and social care staff, placements for medical students and our new programme for people living with long COVID to support their wellbeing. Um, but I'm here to talk to you today about Time to Dance and our work in care homes. And our work in care homes has spanned um, the last few years and includes live um, interactive workshops in person, virtually, and projects, intergenerational projects too. Now, throughout the, the course of the pandemic, as I'm sure you can all relate to, we have really honed in our digital skills. And while we'd already started to, to look at our digital offering as a company, it was really amplified and accelerated significantly in direct response to the pandemic. And within our care homes offering, the first thing that we were able to do was to deliver uh, an online creative digital project that brought together um, a team of artists to explore dance, creativity and connections through dance, um, through visual art, through storytelling as well, using Zoom as a create and filmmaking, sorry, using Zoom as a creative platform, which was central to connecting residents and care homes with uh, participant, community participants as well, drawn from across our three neurological programmes. It was really important for us that within that, as well as there being a product that we were working towards together as a team, as a, as a group of artists, that social connection and that process was of the main driver with the work that we were doing. And we really wanted to create an online virtual community, a sense of connection, throughout this period of isolation and, and a time where, where people weren't able to leave their rooms, where people weren't able to leave their homes, but really still wanted to find that connection to each other and to themselves and to their creativity. Additionally, we also have been running and continue to run weekly online Zoom sessions, not only within our programmes, but also within our communities, um, our network of care homes across Scotland. And we did that because we had been delivering on Facebook Live, but we felt that that didn't give us enough interaction. It didn't have that human connection that was so much missing from the Facebook Live sessions. So we've been able to uh, continue to offer that to care homes across Scotland, offering live music and movement sessions that have social time before and after as well. We also bring in um, costumes and prop into the mix as well so that we can use these to inspire creativity and discussion. We'll play short excerpts of Scottish Ballet foot, uh, footage as well, dance performances, as well as the odd vlog filmed by some of our principal dancers at the ballet, so that residents have a really well-rounded opportunity to engage using a range of access points too. We were invited, very, it was lovely, we were invited in 2021 to be part of the Connect uh, Festival of Friendship, which we didn't manage directly, but we did deliver a 30-minute um, live music and movement session 
which was part of a curated programme, a one day festival that brought together care homes from all across um, the Ayrshire area of Scotland. And it was so lovely to be part of that wider network and celebration of all the fantastic work that was happening with and in care homes all across that geographic area. And that is a format that we would like to try within our team this winter season uh, when we deliver uh, Snow Queen related production workshops in care homes. We'll offer some in person as we always do, and we continue to offer pre-recorded resources too, but we are going to try and bring together the wider network of uh, network of care homes across Scotland that we engage with, because there's a real strength in that, really connecting people socially in that way through the arts. Um, as a company, we released our first feature length film, full length film, The, S the Secret Theatre in December 2020. And the first four weeks of that were an exclusive preview period for friends and membership of Scottish Valley members. But we also extended that out to our partners at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, who um, received the viewing link, the exclusive link for their own tens of thousands of networks across that health board area. Uh, and also some of our Snow Queen um, duet footage as well. But additionally, we also sent that link out to our care home networks across Scotland. And the feedback was that those many of those care homes had their own private viewing parties where they had nibbles and they got dressed up. So it was like they had their own night at the ballet in their own setting, which was really, really lovely to hear that feedback. Lastly, I want to draw attention to our programme Duet, which is a series of resources that we created to really support people who were particularly or who are particularly isolated, who can't leave their rooms or are in hospital settings or they can't leave their homes for whatever reason and who are particularly reduced in their mobility as well. It's been created to be dementia friendly with our neurological experience in mind and they're short resources that are either designed to energize or to relax. They're 10 minutes long, they're pre-recorded and they're available for use in care homes, in hospital settings or at home. Now they're quite different to what we've offered before in that they've been designed very specially, very carefully to be uh, enjoyed safely in bed or at the bedside. Ideally to offer a one-to-one -one experience, a more intimate and gentle one-to-one -one experience with a carer or a companion, whether that be an unpaid carer or a professional carer. Um, and it was really important for us to offer something that wasn't just another dance resource like we already have. We wanted people to to feel entertained and connected to dance in lots of different ways. So the 10 minute resources are created in two halves. The first half is a short excerpt of beautiful Scottish ballet dance footage. And it's then just to be enjoyed, to either lie back or sit back and enjoy it with another person. So it really reduces that isolation and helps somebody to feel the intrinsic benefits of dance before then having a, an invitation to gently move your body to music, either independently or with that other person. Now, as part of this, we offer, um, there is a BSL resource, which we're just about to launch, a Snow Queen uh, inspired BSL resource. We also have our Star Stuck Energize resources and our um, Hod Close to Me Relax resources. We have two films, all of which are captioned. We have user guides, we have two audio resources, and then of course our BSL resource too. Uh, as part of this, we want people to feel really confident and empowered to use these in whatever way is meaningful and relevant to them. So we offer free, they're all free, but we offer free skill up and information resources virtually and in person. And we've been able to stream these live into multiple care homes and other organisations and settings at the one time, bringing people together as a community to learn how they can best use these resources to facilitate and support those they care for to have that really enriching experience.
And lastly, just to finish on that note, um, if we have a panel discussion later, I do have a small call to action about our duet resources um, that I would really love to share if we have time. But just want to say thank you so much um, for inviting us and inviting me to be part of this event today and to listening. And I would really welcome any thoughts or questions or suggestions. Please do be in touch with me if there is anything that you want to discuss further. Um, I'm sure my, my email address is in the bio. I hope I've remembered to put it in there. Fine, thanks. Wonderful. Now, um... Language is of key importance, and I've talked about banning the word retirement and the word physical activity. Uh, we have tried to ban that because uh, everyone I see, it's activity, physical, cognitive, and emotional. Physical, cognitive, and emotional. And we now understand what's happening to us as we live longer. And the, the normal biological process of aging doesn't cause major problems until the late 90s. There are three other processes. One is loss of fitness, physical, cognitive, and emotional. Starting about the age of 22 for most people when they get their first desk job. I've been sitting now for 50 years at various jobs I've done. The, the second process is disease. And disease is like fitness. Much of it is caused by, not lifestyle, but the environment. The car, the computer, the desk job, the sofa. Uh, but there are diseases you need luck to avoid, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And diseases are often complicated by accelerated loss of fitness. And that's due to the third factor, uh, incorrect and negative thinking, ageism. Um, so we need to think in a different way. It's a cultural revolution we need. So I see all of you as revolutionaries. And uh, I think dance is a very good example of a revolutionary technique. And our last speaker, uh, Isaka Sarkar is going to also see at this. Over to you, please. Thank you very much for arranging this wonderful, timely webinar. Um, I'd just like to tell you a couple of my own experiences as an individual dancer. Um, during the dark days of COVID lockdown, I felt desperate to reach out and touch and to do something to uplift that anxiety in the care homes and people being so isolated, almost like prisoned in their own rooms. So I um, contacted a couple of care homes that I have uh, known before, but with no success, there was great anxiety about the security of the Zoom and people were not very comfortable with using anything. So I almost was going to give up my um, hope of doing anything in the care homes when suddenly I had an opportunity through NAPA, National Organization for Arts in Care Homes. Uh, they were collecting resources for um, to be used uh, in the care homes and um, I wanted to offer a dance workshop instead of some resources, which I did have some uh, sheets to work with movement. And uh, fortunately, Alison and Trader from that took the idea. It was a new idea. So it's always hard to do that, promote that. And particularly if you do not have the support of a big organization behind you. But anyway, so they offered it to all the care homes in their um, organization. And out of that, Anchor Care Home took it up. And uh, they offered it to all their care homes all over the country. And about 40 of them uh, actually took it up. So on the day of National Celebration of Arts in Care Homes, uh, we could actually deliver a Zoom workshop to all these 30 care homes in all over the country. Uh, I could do a dance workshop for them with live music. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, it kind of showed that it can be done. We all had worries about it, that how will it work? But as Lisa was saying, uh, in several of the care homes, they had put large screens. And in many of the places, 
because it was an Indian dance workshop. They dressed up in Indian outfit. They uh, decorated the place with banners or whatever artifact they had. Uh, it was really a wonderful, joyful experience to see how they were uh, all the care homes were experiencing. And um, so there was a, the musician, Chris Davis was in uh, Manchester. I was a, a, as a dance lead was in Liverpool. And this was being kind of spread into, you know, sent to stream to all those care homes. And we all could come together. Um, and I can sort of, you know, never forget this experience and uh, mostly um, culturally diverse materials, the dance or music, are not always that accessible and not always taken to the care homes. And uh, I think that's a missed opportunity. We have got so much of things that we can draw from. And the second um, experience was another wonderful one. It was not in care homes, but in the hospital. With the, to a partnership of Shantarao of Annapurna Dance uh, Company and Dr. Richard Cotton, uh, we did uh, streamed again another live dance session in called the Dell Hospital in the geriatric at, um, unit. Uh, there was a small group of people, <clears throat> and there was a really wonderful communication between the two. It, you know, it was a small group. So that was possible. We could have discussion and then take it up with um, a little um, paper boats we used as prop. And uh, because the idea was that Richard had asked me to do something which will give these people a sense of outside because he felt many of those people feel very uh, claustrophobic. They were not really there always uh, from their own wishes. They all just wanted to get out of there. So to bring that sense of being away and somewhere that they, one may like to go and feel comfortable, I got this idea of using some little colorful paper boats so that we can just imagine we are going. So beautiful conversation also came out of that. And we then put it with the live music and the movements. All these are great uh, experiences and they are very much one off, but they suggest that how much we can do with proper research and uh, collaboration, if we can manage to do that. And Lisa also said that, and I think everybody agrees that for this sort of works to succeed, we need a good partnership between the healthcare professionals and the artists. And these are really one thing I'll sort of say uh, at the end, and these are often a low cost solution to bring good, high quality art to care homes. I rest my case here. I'll just play a little bit of the music that I uh, we performed on that day, if um, I can just do that. And I took the... And so you can actually, uh, in terms of interactivity, you can actually ask the people to move with this sort of abstract music. Thank you. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Well, let's look at the time. So we've got about 10 minutes. And it's time for question discussion. I'd like to use the chair's uh, privilege or power to ask uh, Michael and Khalid, uh, do we have a clear two-page statement on what care homes need to do? Um, I think we're aiming for people to have good access in their own room, although it's often good to share. There may be things like the bagpipes you don't want to watch in the lounge. Um, and then the issue of, of staff, is there uh, some simple training of staff? And we've been looking at ways in which that we could get teenagers, particularly boys from the local school, to come in and train because Fortnite has revolutionized the way people think and uh, uh, demonized the lives of many parents of teenage boys. But there's a lot of skill out there. So, Michael and Callie, are we, are we clear in your mission? Uh, we do have a manifesto that we could take to every care home and every retirement housing community and say, this is what is needed. Will I go, Khalid? Go ahead. Um, I think our mission is to persuade the management of care homes that what we're doing is A, going to release carers care, care time, and B, do some good to the, um, to the residents. And I'm not an expert, but I thought most of these activities would if they have the taste. But um, what I don't know is how you communicate this via media, i.e. Uh, not in person, because it strikes me that most of what we've heard is quite expensive per capita if people are having to visit homes, if professionals are having to visit homes to do it. And until we can actually find exactly what can be communicated, preferably two ways over some kind of medium, then I think it's going to be quite, it's going to sound rather middle class, rather I mean, there is a danger that care homes are already very expensive and are the prerogative of the well-off. Um, state care homes don't exist and those that are mainly council run are losing money. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a social challenge here. Yes, Kelly, yes. any comment? Yes, I, I mean, I would add to that. There's, there are clear, clear obstacles that we have to overcome. And What's so frustrating, I think, as everybody will have picked up from this excellent um, webinar today, is that there are lots of resources out there, plenty of things that can be delivered. The issue is that final, as they call it, the final mile, getting it into where it needs to be got into. I mean, we are working on, um, uh, Michael will tell you more about this if he wants to, but we are working on trying to have a pilot or two to see if we can get it working i mean the main thing is not to try to do everything all at once so if we can get something working that's the start and sadly enough you know, money will be involved but if you start to see it working and if in some of the uh, dare i use the word upmarket care homes where people are paying significant sums already you can offer something as a package uh, to add on to the care. I, I mean, the the actual um, uh, use of this is, is so useful to the people who are doing the visiting, if you like, of, of the people living with, with dementia. It really is because uh, they are often struggling to make this contact, as I've said before, really struggling to make that contact. And uh, this will help. We, you can see it's going to help. The other point is, Muir, it's an excellent idea of yours to bring in youngsters who are very, very agile on the tech. Uh, if for no other reason, then there's nothing so powerful as I've seen in my in involvement with um, uh, elderly disability charities, uh, whereby you can get young people mixing across the social divide with older people. And, I am often amazed at the connection they do make. Well, we want them to make two connections, the obvious social one, but actually make the technological connection too and make it really easy for people to make the tech work. Uh, and that includes the carers too, because a lot of the carers, of course, are coming from 
relatively humble uh, circumstances and they themselves won't be that tech savvy so there's a lot to do there and we do have as you say Muir that that tremendous resource of young people who we could I don't know how you do it you probably do it through people like the scouts and, and the cadets and people like that you know, and say we, we need um, some volunteers to come and work in care homes to train people in tech uh, or maybe just somebody to be there when if we get all this tech in to sort of firefight and troubleshoot, you know, the, the, the mini IT department, if you know, yeah. it's very exciting. We've just got to get it started somewhere. And then I believe the rest will follow. Michael? Well, we're, we're just pioneering a, a scheme with the University of Winchester, whereby its media and communication students adopt a, a person with dementia and help them devise and produce and use the media of their choice. That's the kind of thing. Yes, I can always tell those teenage boys to go white when I mention Fortnite. Jane Mullins has gone white in the in the, uh, <laughs> in the, the chat room. So I think what we're, we're seeing, Veronica, is... Uh, we, there's wonderful things taking place. There's the potential to develop it. We probably need to write it up as though for, it's probably the, the social services committee level because they're responsible for inspecting private homes as well as delivering care and people in their own homes. We have to remember people who are isolated and uh, think in that way. And then uh, two opportunities. One, there is a thing called the Dementia Care Plan that is uh, was due to be published earlier in the year, but I think we've had three secretaries of state since then. So we need to keep our eye open for that. And I think um, actually Michael would be a very good person to um, get in front of the new secretary of state because there'll be, there'll be money floating about there, I can tell you. And then, Veronica, I think we need to bring together uh, we start to build a, a, a resource and we actually met someone who used to be the chief exec of Alzheimer's UK uh, and Jeremy Hughes, but he's now setting up, I think, uh, some sort of digital network. So I think we need to bring some of the, these things together just a little bit. Each continues with its own unique identity and method, but they all need the wiring and the staff able to do it. So, uh, Veronica, last word to you. I think it's wonderful what you've done as always in bringing people together. Uh, you're, uh, you're a star, Veronica. Thank um, you for your absolutely brilliant inspiration for all of this. Um, the um, Social Prescribing Student Champion Scheme could be involved um, in some of this. You know, they, 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 they were accompanying our our own workshops, but they work together with the arts teams, and maybe they could, um, you know, you, uh, contribute as part of their um, um, part of their curriculum um, and their uh, dissertation. All so so fascinating. Thank you, thank you very very much. So I was, I'd just just briefly like to thank you for thank you all actually, and to take forward all the suggestions you've made, um, um, Muir and and more and and all the other suggestions that have cropped up in the chat. And let's hope that arts and health partnerships such as yours that we've heard today will enable cultural gems to stream into care homes. And as the technology develops, and we've been hearing so much um, um, from Charles and, and from you all, um, <clears throat> we shall think of VR and live streaming reaching all over the world. While here in London, um, the Wigmore Hall, the Royal Opera House, the National Theatre, English National Ballet, the South Bank Centre, um, and others stream regularly. The residents, Nigel, the residents of the Social Welfare Institute in Shanghai show you how. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a little fun end piece. And while we're waiting for it to come online, um, we'll share with you all the resources.
<laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Nigel, for being terrific behind the scenes. And where we couldn't necessarily always hear the music to your videos, um, in the recording you will hear the whole lot and we'll give you the links in the transcript. Um, and um, I'm sure everybody would want to share um, emails. There's been a lot of ask, a lot of um, requests for speakers to share emails. Um, so we'll be in touch with you. Let's, Thank let's, you, Muir. Let's Thank call it. Let's call it the day. We'll use the digital world. Word. I think it will be helpful. There's probably going to be a lump of money in the dementia care plan of the word digital. Um, and the danger is that's all spent in alarm systems. So we need to be ready for that. So we'll use the word digital. And uh, this is digital therapy, the digital revolution. Digital and something. thank you, Veronica. The digital revolution gets underway on the 8th of November 2022. So, viva the revolution! <laughs>